Okay. Hi, I'm Jacob Heilgren, Senior Editor at The National Interest, and I'm discussing Peter Skoblik's new book, Us Versus Them. Peter is the Executive Editor at The New Republic. Peter's book caught my eye because it promises not only to illuminate why the Bush administration went astray, but the deeper origins of the flawed policies that he identifies as going back to 50 years. Now, Peter, many conservatives would argue, I believe, that you've offered something of a caricature of the conservative movement, that there are, in fact, different strands, one exemplified by Richard Nixon and Dwight D. Eisenhower that emphasized the limits of American power, and the other, the insurgent force that you traced that came to to power with the Bush administration. What makes you think that it's really conservatism that's undermined America's security? Well, let me, let me go back just 30 seconds, Jacob, and, and point out that the title of the book is actually a pun, and it's U.S. versus them, which also gives us us, us versus them, obviously. Um, I think the, the book recognizes that there are different strains of conservatism, but, you know, to the extent that it's a caricature of conservatism, it's, it's one that the modern conservative movement um, supplied itself. Um, as, I, as I say in the book, sort of in the immediate post-war period, it's, it's difficult for us to, to understand this now, but there wasn't really such a thing as ideological conservatism. Conservatism before the war had meant isolationism. It had meant a, a strongly pro-business policy domestically, a, 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 a hands-off uh, government policy in terms of managing the economy. And, and the Great Depression and, and our intervention in World War II sort of cut the legs out from both of those ideas. And after the war, there were a number of people on the right who just weren't happy with sort of the status quo, the the consensus that had developed, which was, you know, largely pro-New Deal and uh, pro-American involvement in the world through, you know, NATO and the Marshall Plan and, and containment of the Soviet Union. And a very you know, clearly self-identified conservative movement arose around William F. Buckley and National Review, and they took it upon themselves to define what a new conservatism would be. And that very much included this good versus evil, us versus them of the world that I, I think has led the Bush administration astray. Okay, but if it's not simply been conservatives, as your own book acknowledges, and it wrestles with the rise of the neoconservatives. Mm-hmm. But one thing that is missing from your book, I believe, is a discussion as well of the liberal hawks. Mm-hmm. And I wonder if you quote, for example, from an Anthony Lewis column that he wrote in 1976 that I also quote in my own book. They knew they were right about the neocons. And in that column, Lewis pointed very specifically at what he called a new intellectual military complex, taking off on Dwight D. Eisenhower. And he argued that it was the liberals who were quite significant, even in 1976, and he pointed the finger at um, both commentary as well as the New Republic magazine Mm -hmm. in 1976. I found that quite interesting. And what he was writing about, of course, was the nomination of Paul Warnke. And he pointed out the New Republic led the charge against Warnke. So one thing that I wonder about is how much of this is conservatism and how much of it is liberal hawks? What is your view? Well, you know, I think, I think liberal hawk is it's a bit of a squishy term. The, one of the reasons that I went back to conservatism in the 1950s is that I think it's there that you can really distill what the essence of conservative foreign policy is. And it's this binary, dualistic, Manichaean view of the world, um, you know, that, that separates things very cleanly into black and white, which, you know, in some ways was an apt description of the Cold War. It was just not a very useful frame for waging the Cold War, um, in part because the, the nuclear revolution required that we reach some degree of cooperation with the Soviets if we weren't going to both blow ourselves up. The you know, liberals in the 40s and 50s recognized 
the evil of the Soviet Union. And I think they sort of split into a, a couple of camps. One recognized that while the Soviet Union was evil, we still had to deal with them diplomatically and you know, try to negotiate some kind of nuclear status quo. And the others really took the, the, the observation that communism and the Soviets were evil. And, and like conservatives, um, used it as a literal guide for how we would approach strategy. And in the 70s, after Vietnam, that split became a lot more apparent. And uh, sort of the, the more liberal or, or realist school sort of veered a little bit left after Vietnam. The other school veered a little bit right and, and became the neocons, who you, know, you can probably speak about a, a lot better than I can. And the reason that they were able to to meld so seamlessly with the conservatives is that they too had this this good versus evil view of the world that that wasn't just a moral observation, but they actually took it as a strategic guide for how U.S. foreign policy should be waged. But in a sense, not to to dive too much into the historical interstices of, of these issues, but you ascribe a lot of importance to James Burnham, mm-hmm. and I agree with that. And Burnham was one of Bill, William F. Buckley's close associates right. with the National Review. And now Burnham, in my view, comes very much out of the sort of the neoconservative camp since he was involved. He was a Trotskyist in the 1930s. It's true, he, he came from an upper-class family. He didn't share the Jewish background of many of the neocons, but he was very close to Sidney Hook. And he, in a sense... Is, is the first to uh, push for the rollback strategy. Right. And if you look at the other people around Buckley, Willy Schlamm from Austria, again, another ex-leftist. Uh, uh, this came home to me I, when I was looking at some, some papers that uh, Sam Tannenhaus had about the founding of National Review, mm-hmm. a, a few pages that Buckley had disseminated uh, to, as a fundraising measure, it was a private letter to, 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 that was supposed to be sent to receptive donors. But the letter sounds very much like a neoconservative, talking about elites in the university that have to be combated, how America needs to take a more aggressive stance in foreign policy. So I wonder, ultimately, how much of this comes out of, of the left is a weird fusion of, of Wilsonianism Wilsonianism and uh, Trotskyist eddies from the 1930s that really explain both the the National Review and then the later neocon um, rise. Mm-hmm. Um, well, it's 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 possible to, to slice the ideological salami pretty thin here. And as as you say, I think you're right that that you know a lot of the National Review crowd did come out of the left. I mean, you know, Frank Meyer as well, and you know, Burnham and. And, and a bunch of those guys. Um, I think, though, that you'd have to say that the dominant trend on the left before World War II was toward greater international cooperation and greater interdependence. And, and that's really, you know, to put it in the, in the parlance of the book, is, you know, more of an us and them sort of view of the U.S. role globally, that we cannot stand apart from you know, the events of, of Europe or anywhere else were, were integrally a, a, a part of that. And, you know, the right at that time, although there were Republican internationalists, the, the sort of further on the right in terms of Taft and folks like that were really going in the opposite direction, you know, trying to keep the United States out of Europe. You know, similarly on, on domestic affairs, you know, the left was very clearly going toward increasing government management of the economy and then you know, sort of, you know, stimulus and unemployment programs with the New Deal. And, and the right was, was you know, furious at, at that sort of overreach. Um, so, you know, while there, you know, may have been, a, you know, I think a revolutionary tendency among a lot of, of sort of the National Review conservatives early in their career, they, they you know, didn't translate that revolutionary impulse uh, you know, after the war into to anything that I think could be construed as liberal and, you know, right, measured right. by the way that, that sort of others in, in yes. American liberal politics were going. That's true. I want to push you, however, once more uh-huh. on this liberal hawk because I'm not satisfied with 
uh, your your discussion of it so far. Uh-huh. And the reason is, it seems to me that it is a pertinent issue. I just was looking at a afterword that Sidney Blumenthal wrote this morning to a uh, newly released volume on Walter Lippmann's writings on the press. And Blumenthal points out that the Washington Post editorialized in favor of the Iraq War 26 times mm-hmm. between two ta- 2002 and when it broke out. And he also notes that some of its editorials were titled with irrefutable. Um, the magazine you work for has kind of done a U-turn on the Iraq War. You have uh, Matthew Iglesias coming out with a new book in, in which I haven't seen the book, but I believe he uh, excoriates the liberal hawks. And then you have someone like Paul Berman on the other end who, who is on the left and is coming out with a book called The Flight of the Intellectuals who's arguing that uh, people like Ian Baruma are cowed by the, by the Muslim threat. I just want wonder where, I mean, you may not identify as a liberal hawk. I wonder still what your assessment is. If you're going to pin the Bush administration's uh, war on conservatism, I still, I still strikes me that you have to acknowledge what was the role of the liberal hawks and how much significance do you ascribe to it. Well, it might be more accurate to say that I pin the the failings of the Bush administration, you know, not on conservatism per se, but on this sort of Manichaean worldview that happened to have been adopted by conservatives immediately after World War II in a way that it wasn't adopted by liberals. Now, there's no... I mean, I, I don't consider myself a liberal hawk. There's no saying that, that a Manichaean worldview, sort of a, you know, a moralistic binary worldview, is the sole province of people on the right. Um, I think it happens to have been most clearly and consistently and fully expressed by those on the right. But it's certainly been picked up by members of the left, too, people who tend to think um, in, in more moralistic terms. And that includes you know, the neocons in the 70s. And I think it included um, the liberal hawks in the run-up to the Iraq War. Um, there's, there's no denying that the Bush administration received a lot of support from you know, so-called liberal hawks as it decided to go to war. And I think that support came about from a similarly... Um, overly simplified view of the world that, that divides it into two halves. Yeah, I think, I think it does give your book a real propulsive force because you have a very clear thesis. I would, uh, just as a footnote, I would say that, that Harry Truman and Dean Acheson had a pretty Manichaean view of the world as well. I mean, it was Acheson who said that, we, that he had to be clearer than the truth in discussing the Soviet threat. And Truman himself acknowledged that uh, he was he was somewhat hyping it in order to get the American public aroused, and so that it didn't fall back into isolation. As, right, and as I mean, a, in, the, in the book, I use those those two things as examples of of showing that while you know both Truman and Atchison did did speak in in kind of black and white terms, that they did so self consciously. Um, right, recognizing right. That, that what they were saying was not entirely reflective of reality. And, and when, um, you know, Acheson appeared before the Senate to testify on containment, um, you know, he was, it, it was brought to his attention that, listen, if you really believe that this is a battle between good and evil, um, you know, then we've got to fight the Soviet Union everywhere, and we're talking about a global conflict. And Acheson said, you know, no, 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 that's not what we're, that's not how we envision this. And, and that sort of suggests that, that his view and, and Truman's view was, was somewhat more muted. Um, you know, but we are, you know, we are parsing this sort of finely because the rhetoric right. often, often right. was pretty, pretty black and white. <clears throat> but as, as journalists, of course, there is that natural predilection to, uh, to, to parse things pretty finely. Um, I wondered about, we'll, we'll discuss some of the, the, your book is really about arms control at essence, which is, and for me, it was quite fascinating. But w- before we discuss that, one thing that struck me is you had a quote there from Barry Goldwater mm-hmm. in the ni- early 1960s saying uh, that Americans are starting to have a craven fear of death. Right. How, how, now, that, that really is redolent of... Uh, language, I would say, for interwar Europe, a kind of fascist war- worship, uh, a cult mm. of of death, and 
You go very much into the, and I'm not calling Cold War a fascist, but I do think it is, as I said, redolent. How, how much do you believe uh, was, how much of this was cultural? When you, ha- when you have politicians talking like that, you talk a lot about, about the bombs, the number of ICBMs on each side, but how much of this was also kind of a, a cultural war, a sort of cult of, of American manhood on the right? Mm. Um, it's, it's an interesting way to, to look at it. Um, and there's, uh, I think, probably a lot of psychology wrapped up in how different sides saw the, the arms race. And it's, it's not something I, I get into tremendously. I think, you know, there was certainly a, a cultural element to conservatism um, then, you know, much as there is a, a, a cultural component to it now that had an impact on international relations. Um, you know, conservatives tended to be um, you know, more from the Midwest, for example. They tended not to have the same, uh, you know, business ties or personal ties to Europe that the, their more internationalist counterparts did. Um, you know, when it, when it comes to dealing with, with nuclear war, um, I, I think there were people on the right who, you know, almost didn't seem to have internalized how serious the, the, Situation they were talking about was, you know, war had had traditionally been something where um, you you really you did need to be stronger than the other guy. You needed to be more motivated than the other guy. You're very masculine enterprise. You've got to attack the enemy. You've got to attack your own fear. And the interesting thing is that when you come to nuclear weapons, all of that stuff goes out the window. It not only are the consequences much greater, you know, the the possible you know ends of a nuclear war, but the means. Um, that you've applied to conventional warfare don't don't make as much sense anymore. They can lead to these sort of perverse outcomes where, you know, by by being uh, the greater warrior psychologically, you may end up just blowing everybody up, and you've got to come at it in sort of a counterintuitive, more cooperative approach. And what does a cooperative approach to war mean? I mean, this is what, you know, people like Goldwater and the theorists at Rand and, and all of these guys that were thinking about it were wrestling with at the time. And I think that, that sort of complexity uh, was harder for some people than for others. And I think it was harder for people who had a tendency to see the world in black and white terms. Well, Peter, you talk a lot about, speaking of the RAND Corporation, you talk about the prisoner's dilemma, right. the ultimate advantages of cooperation. And, of course, the, the RAND people spent years coming up with tomes about how to wage nuclear war and how to survive the nuclear war. And, uh, of course, it was parodied in Dr. Strangelove, Herman Kahn. There's even a new book out about the Rand Corporation now. But how much, when you're, you know, your book could, I think, be attacked as being a little, maybe a little bloodless and technocratic. I mean, if we're dealing with uh, Iran, for example, what, what's the incentive for Iran to cooperate? If, if and this gets to a further point in your book that uh, I don't quite agree with, is would you uh, tend to dismiss the nature of regimes? You attack conservatives for uh, ascribing excessive importance to the totalitarian nature of the Soviet Union and that they became too, too fixated with good versus evil and that, uh, you know, arms control agreements could be reached with the Soviet Union. It wasn't an irrational actor. But what do you do with a country like Iran, where the, where the nature of the regime, a, a militant theocracy, where uh, its president has uh, explicitly called for wiping out Israel, and uh, this has led conservatives like Charles Krauthammer to uh, denounce the idea of, of negotiations and figure out how to create some kind of deterrence against the Iranians. What's, what's the, you know, you talk in your book about creating an international sort of enrichment scheme. I think that goes back to the, to the late 40s. Yeah. But the, the nuclear genie is out of the bottle. Isn't, mm-hmm. isn't the problem that, uh, you know, country, it's true that some countries have, have abandoned nuclear weapons, like South Africa, but uh, a lot of these wacky third world countries seem to be quite intent on procuring them. Yeah. Well, I mean, I'll tell you, one of the things that, that 
tends to confuse me is when people who worry more about the evil nature of regimes um, simultaneously decide to to essentially give up and let those regimes get weapons and then say that we just have to deter them. Um, you know, the point of negotiation is to prevent that from happening in the first place. And so once you're relying on deterrence and defense, you you know, you've basically given up on on the spread of nuclear weapons happening and, and of those weapons spreading to, to some of the nastiest places on the planet. I mean, I don't think that the nuclear genie is out of the bottle in the sense that the nonproliferation regime and, you know, actions taken around it have actually done a pretty good job of limiting the number of nations that have gone nuclear. Um, you know, we've, we've, you know, of, I mean, I'd have to, to look at my calendar and double check the dates, but North Korea is really the only state that's, um, you know, gone uh, and developed a, an actual weapons capability um, and in the last number of years in the sense that, you know, the in Indians and the Pakistanis and the Israelis have been look at working on their weapons programs long before they actually conducted tests in 98. Um, as far as negotiating with Iran, I mean, I think that the way you make it work is you make it work in the same way that any other negotiation works, which is you present a set of costs and a set of benefits, you convince the state that the benefits outweigh the costs. If they don't, you up the costs and, and you go from there. And, you know, I don't think we've done a particularly good job of that with Iran. Now, that does assume that the Iranian leadership at some level, you know, if not in the person of Mahmoud Ahmadinejad, then in, you know, the, the supreme leaders and the others um, in the parliament do operate on a rational basis. But we've seen a lot of evidence of rational behavior um, in terms of the Iranians approaching the United States both uh, you know, during and after the invasion of Afghanistan to offer help. Then after the Iraq War, uh, the Iranian government wanted to, to uh, develop, you know, some sort of uh, dialogue, perhaps toward a grand bargain with the United States. And then, you know, I mean, at least according to this national intelligence estimate that was released a few months ago, you know, they stopped work on their nuclear weapons program in the wake of increased international attention and IAEA inspection, all this sort of thing. So, you know, all of those things suggest that there, there are, you know, at least rational elements within the Iranian government. And if we can engage those elements, then the idea is it gives you a chance to, you know, stop at least the weapons program, hopefully the whole damn thing, um, and, and not force us to rely on deterrence, which, although it can be very stable, is also a, a pretty imperfect beast. Now, how would you feel if someone argued, well, the most successful nonproliferation effort actually was undertaken by the Israelis in 1981 when they bombed Syrac in Iraq? That, in fact, you know, we can sign all the paper treaties we want and, and try and cut deals, but a regime like Iran isn't going to obey it, and you need yeah. to use all-out force. Yeah. I mean, that's basically the argument, I think, of, of Norman Podoritz, uh -huh. that there is no compromise here. Uh -huh. We've been through this before. We know it's all a sham. Yeah. Yeah, you know, I mean, it's, it's not an either-or situation. Um, uh, you know, one example that I talk about in the book and uh, – you know, one, one theme that I hope that people do take away from the book is the importance of, of kind of an iron fist velvet glove approach. I mean, this is not all about carrots. This is also about sticks. And you've seen the combination of the two used effectively in a number of nonproliferation instances. Um, you know, one, one that I cite is the 1994 crisis with North Korea over its, you know, the nuclear program that it had at that point. And the Clinton administration was pursuing negotiations, but it was also building up force uh, on the Korean Peninsula in preparation to strike the North's nuclear facilities if negotiations failed. And, you know, according to the American negotiators, that, you know, threat implicit or explicit of force helped bring the, the uh, you know, a conclusion to, to a deal um, that, that served a lot of good for a number of years. Um, you can see the run-up to the Iraq War as another example of that. I mean, you know, one of the ironies is that before the Iraq War became uh, the failure that it is, it was a, an incredible success of Iron Fist Velvet Glove diplomacy, where we had something we wanted, uh, namely inspections of uh, Iraq's supposed WMD facilities. We were not getting them, built up a military presence in the region. We got inspections and, you know, learned that there, there was no ongoing nuclear program. Um, you know, the mistake was was either not continuing the inspections or, or stopping there. But, um, you know, force is a, is a 
you know, an absolutely central component of nonproliferation policy. It's just not, you know, an alternative to diplomacy. It has to go, you know, hand in glove. What about uh, a ballistic missile defense? What's wrong with that? What's, what's, um, what's the problem with creating a limited interceptor system, as the administration is trying to do, to, uh, to, that would actually, if it was successful, help promote deterrence because it would cause America's enemies to have more, or more uncertainty about whether their missiles that they launched would actually reach American territory or not. Why isn't that another effective counterproliferation scheme? You know, I think all things being equal, um, it could be. I think the, the problem comes in the fact that all, th- all other things are, are not equal. Um, one, one problem is that there is a tendency of people who promote missile defense to simultaneously disparage negotiation. So they disparage a preventive action and instead say, well, we'll fall back and rely on this defense. And of course, you know, prevention is, is far more effective um, than, than even a, a pretty effective defense. The, the other thing, and this kind of gets us back to Cold War thinking, but it's something that you've, you've got to keep in mind, is we still have a nuclear balance with the Russians, and we still have a nuclear balance with the Chinese. And well, it's not even the balance. I mean, we have great superiority. We do have great superiority, you mean, over the Chinese? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I mean certainly but, over the Chinese. I mean, one of the, one, you know, but one of the problems with nuclear weapons is that, you know, the Chinese have enough nuclear weapons to take out, you know, the, the biggest 25 American cities. So, you know, you could say, you know, we've, we've got overwhelming superiority, but we're, we're still quite vulnerable. And, you know, let's talk about the Chinese example, for instance. If right now the Chinese have a, you know, what's called a minimum deterrent force, they don't have a lot of weapons, but they could do unacceptable damage if, if they wanted right. to. But if the United States were intent on launching a first strike, it would have the upper hand. It would have the upper hand, and missile defense cements that upper hand. Let's say the United States and China got in a conflict over the Taiwan Strait. Things get very, very tense. The Chinese fear that the United States is going to launch some kind of nuclear strike. Um, and and basically decide that they have to get their missiles off first, A, because uh, the United States could take out a lot of their missiles on the ground, B, they've got to worry about this missile defense wiping out the rest of them. And so they've really, you know, got to, they're, they're in a position where they've got to maximize the utility of their force and, and basically use them or lose them. You know, that's not the, the kind of operating dynamic you want in a crisis situation. If we could have a missile defense that were, you know, solely geared toward one or two North Korean weapons or a handful of Iranian weapons or something like that, you know, Fine, then that just adds another layer, as you say, onto, onto deterrence and defense. But if it destabilizes a relationship with a country that's got the ability to essentially blow you up, then you've, you've got to think twice and you've got to think about how they perceive this. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean that there's no way to go forward, um, but it, it, that's, that's the downside. Well, I'd like to put another, you know, when we were talking earlier about re- the nature of regimes, I'd like to pursue that a little more, because we, we worry more about certain regimes having nuclear weapons than others, yeah, right? we do. And it, we're not really concerned about India. We're concerned about it vis-a-vis Pakistan, but not vis-a-vis the United States. And the Israeli nuclear force doesn't bother the United States at all either. But you and your book tend to... Uh, Poor scorn on, for example, Richard Pipes, who uh, d- d- complained after the end of the Cold War about the so- sort of social science, the dry as dust analysis of the Soviet Union, failing. Right. To, you know, he complained about failing to take culture into account. Again, I just wonder, in the case of of Iran or other regimes, would you really argue that we can just? Uh, in a sterile fashion, reach agreements with regimes, no matter what their nature is, simply because they'll see that it's in their self-interest? Well, once again, I mean, you know, you're, you're presupposing that we're dealing with rational actors. Rational actors can operate in their, in their self-interest. The, the Soviet Union was able to operate in its self-interest. And, and you know, I don't think that, I, I, I can't think of any bit of evidence showing that, that you know, Soviet communism or, you know, the Soviet definition of morality um, impacted their nuclear weapon stands. Their, you know, nuclear strategy can be a very cold thing. 
Um, you know, there's... Well, what about, what about, let's get to the real biggie. I yeah. mean, we've sort of been dancing around this, but let's face it, what, what the neocons and the conservatives, and it's in your book, it's in my book, it's this obsession with Munich, 1938, yeah. right? Yeah. Many of the arguments that, that you were making were um, were made in the in the 30s by Stanley Baldwin and others. We have to preserve peace. We have to reach an accommodation. There are mutual interests here. Of course, you know Hitler was a gambler. He he threw over the board. He had no and he was not a what we would call a rational actor. So I suppose the the fear that looms over a, a neoconservative would argue, I think, that you need to be. Prepared for the worst case scenario, you can't rely on this cozy assumption that there are going to be. But what what is the interest. assumption, Jacob? Well, that they're going to if, be rational. If you're if you're if you're if you are uh, Norman Podoritz or or other neocons, you think that Iran president really means what he says. He wants to acquire nuclear weapons and uh, take out Israel, and even if. Iran acquired nuclear weapons and didn't use them. I still think that the acquisition by Iran would, would obviously trigger an, an arms race in the region. Well, I mean, I think we're I think we're mostly in in agreement there. I mean, you know, negotiating with Iran does not assume good faith on no, Iran's part. No. Negotiation with the Soviet Union did not assume good faith. Negotiation with North Korea. I mean, you know, I I've spent some time talking to the Americans who, who negotiated the agreed framework. And, you know, believe me, there's not a supposition so, that, that, you know, the, the leaders in Pyongyang are, are warm and fuzzy. And there's no reason that we should approach Iran that way either. But, you right, know, the but thing people, about nuclear right. weapons is that, you know, if you keep Iran from having nuclear weapons, it doesn't really matter what their intentions are. You know, um, similarly, if they have nuclear weapons, we're, there's no way that we're going to be reassured by, you know, protestations that their intentions are warm and fuzzy. And so ultimately it just strikes me that, that you know, eliminating the, the, the material, the weapons that can do the damage is really what you want to focus on. Everything else is, you know, it's, it's far more of an abstract question. It's, A, a question that we can't answer in terms of what really are their intentions. And it's a question that even if we had an answer, we wouldn't be satisfied with it because you do have to assume the worst when you're talking but about you, nuclear you have you have Charles Krauthammer arguing that a Holocaust declaration should be signed yeah. by American presidents directly tying the American nuclear missile force to Israel's survival. Yeah. And be, so you see that, I mean, what essentially what I think Krauthammer and others are arguing is that it's you're wasting your breath talking to the Iranians. You know, I mean, the, the fact of the matter is we haven't tried. Um, you know, the United States has not talked to the Iranians about about its nuclear weapons program. Now, that's you know, for a variety of reasons. I mean, mostly the Bush administration just refused to talk for a number of years. Now the administration, you know, will talk if Iran, you know, suspends uranium enrichment, which is the goal of the negotiation. So it's it's sort of an odd precondition. Um, well, let's look but, at the history then. Let's go back and talk a little about the history of arms control, which you delve into yeah. quite uh, quite thoroughly in your book. Now, I'd like to challenge your assessment, or what I think is your assessment, of the 1970s and 80s, and and it would briefly be, what's so great about arms control? I mean, you, you know, you pretty much defend Paul Warnke and some of these other actors against the neocons, Mm -hmm. but the the SALT-1 and SALT-2, SALT-2, which was never ratified because of the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan, these treaties never actually cut... Uh, American or or Soviet arsenals, they they imposed limits, mm-hmm. but uh, you know, arms control you could argue became kind of a quasi religion in the seventies and eighties. It really didn't produce much. It was in the end only when the Soviet Union was collapsing that Mikhail Gorbachev was really and and Ronald Reagan, who had been interested in the abolition of nuclear weapons since the late forties, came together and just slashed the arsenals. They sort of did a, an end run a, around the arms controllers. Mm-hmm. What 
didn't arms control simply become an industry in the 70s and 80s with not that much accomplishment to show for it? And, and given that record, why would we repose all that much confidence in it today? Uh, um, I, you know, it's, it's a good point about, about the SALT treaties um, in, in terms of, of saying that, you know, the actual numbers didn't go down. But what was, what was significant about, um, you know, particularly about SALT 1, which, um, you know, this, the SALT 1 interim agreement, which, which CAP forces, um, was signed at the same time that the anti-ballistic missile treaty was signed. And what those treaties did was recognize that there was a, a situation of, you know, mutual assured destruction that existed between the United States and the Soviet Union. And in effect said, a nuclear war is not winnable, and therefore it can't be fought. And it was, it laid that, you know, theoretical or strategic framework on the table. It put it on a piece of paper. The Soviets and the Americans signed it and basically said, okay, so we're all on the same page. Neither one of us is going to benefit from nuking the other first, so there's not a whole lot of point in seeking advantage, uh, you know, in increasing number of, of warheads or, or missiles or, or what have you. And that recognition was stabilizing. And the, you know, what, what SALT one and SALT two, and then, you know, the START treaties were, were intended to do was to continue to, to keep that stability while gradually drawing down the number of, of weapons that there were. Um, so that's but, sort you know, of the, those that's, treaties, those treaties were designed to, in a sense, to ratify the status quo. That's right. Well, they were to and establish the so status. They what, were to what, establish agreement on the status quo, and then right. and then to ratify it. You know, by by perpetuating it. But they also they also redounded to the benefit of the Soviet Union in the sense that America signaled that it wasn't going to engage in regime change. Then you have Ronald Reagan. But how are you going to engage in regime change with with nuclear weapons? I mean, this is not giving something up. This is simply an acknowledgement of reality. And and the problem, and this is the no. But the counter argument, Peter, mm-hmm. would be that Reagan did exactly what Paul Warnke uh, said in that foreign policy article that we shouldn't do. He went out, and uh, and I know you disagree with this in your book, yeah. But Reagan uh, went out and and spent them into the ground on the military issue, and they caved. Yeah, I mean the data just don't show that. Um, uh, it's, you know, Reagan, when he came into office in the first three years, he, he took a tack that was, was opposite to that of the, the SALT agreements, the sort of mutual assured, you know, destruction uh, framework that we, we just talked about. He, he opposed those treaties and he did the opposite. You know, he, you know, increased uh, spending on nuclear weapons. He pursued missile defense. He pursued um, civil defense, you know, you know, bomb shelters for people. Um, all of these things were designed to, uh, you know, enable the United States to fight and win a nuclear war, which I think, in retrospect, I mean, I hope you would agree with this, was, it was a fairly absurd concept. Um, and, you know, what it, what it led to, uh, you know, as I describe in the book, was a, you know, a lot of factors led to a crisis toward the end of 1983 where the, the Soviets got very paranoid and thought the United States might actually be contemplating a first strike, and that was enormously destabilizing. Um, and, and, you know, when Reagan found out just how scared the Soviets were, he was sort of taken aback. I mean, what were we doing that was so aggressive, that was so frightening? Um, I, you know, I think it's fairly apparent in retrospect that, you know, establishing a force that, that is intended to win a nuclear war is, is frightening. And that's when Reagan changed tax. And, and fortunately, Gorbachev came into office shortly thereafter, and, and they began negotiating ways to reduce the arms race and, and you, know, you know, keep things on an even keel. By that point, the Soviet Union had already been in severe economic trouble for a long time. Um, and, you know, it was, it was fortunate that, that Gorbachev, you know, recognized that, that he came into office and decided he had to make a fundamental change. But, you know, the Soviets were, were not responding to another round of U.S. spending. Um, it's just, it's a causal relationship that's just, you know, not borne out by the, the numbers and the chronology. Fair enough. Um, we won't, we won't. <laughs> um, the reason I mentioned uh, regime change, which is an anachronistic term, because I don't think that Reagan truly thought that the Soviet Union would collapse as quickly as it did. I, I do believe he wanted to intensify the pressure yes. 
And uh, one of the interesting things Richard Pipe really doesn't get much credit for in his book, Survival is Not Enough. He actually says the Soviet Union is a failing enterprise. And uh, that's, you know, again, gets to that. I think a historian had a better, interestingly, had a better feel for what was going on in the Soviet Union than the CIA. I have less faith in social science than I think you do. Mm -hmm. But the reason I bring up uh, regime change is, I suppose you would argue that the the collapse of the Soviet Union and the what what conservatives interpreted as uh, a successful successful version of, of regime change. I mean, in 1989, you 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 would argue, uh, you know, 30 40 years of conservatism have triumphed, right? But now, based on the Iraq War, you are you're sort of drawing a uh, a line arguing. Would you argue that the that the Soviet Union led was really the collapse of the Soviet Union set the basis for the Iraq War and the the the, the uninterest in continuing sanctions and for more aggressive foreign policy? Um, I'm not sure I totally follow you. I think that. I mean, first of all, I think that, you know, if we were having this conversation... Well, just simply, and, simply that a triumphalist version of American history arose. Oh, and, uh-huh. In fact, the conservatives, look, look, they were riding high in 1989. I mean, yeah. it would have been really rough for a book like yours to come out in 1989 and argue that the conservatives were a bunch of loonies, as, as uh, Maybe, many you know, of the stories in your book would suggest. It's, it's interesting, though, in the late 80s, you know, by the end of Reagan's second term, conservatives had turned on him, um, you know... True, but then they deified him. Gorbachev right. and, and right. you know, doing all these sorts of things that, that <clears> did... <throat> You know, ease the fall of the Soviet Union. So they weren't they weren't particularly high on the guy at the time, either. And I, I actually think that you know Reagan did an enormous amount of good. But I don't think that you know Reagan's approach to the Cold War, a conservative approach to the Cold War, brought about the end of the Soviet Union. What I do think is that a conservative approach to nuclear weapons and arms control, you know, almost uh, led us to nuclear war in, in late 1983 and, and exacerbated the risk of nuclear war, certainly with no apparent benefit. Um, you know, As the Bush administration then today exacerbated the very evil that it sought to suppress, is the danger of a nuclear detonation in downtown Washington, D.C., much higher now than it was seven years ago? Yeah, you know, I mean, I think that is hard to say. I think there are things on, on both letters of the column. On the, on the positive side of the column, you have a couple of things that have happened. You've got... Um, there have been seven more years of an effort to lock down fissile material in the former Soviet Union. And that is not a program that the Bush administration has pursued uh, with any sort of enthusiasm, but they have, um, you know, it has been uh, funded over the last seven years. And so there has been progress made there. You also have the the denuclearization of Libya, which is a a good thing. They didn't have any fissile material or weapons, but they had a program. Um, you know that that may have been mothballed, but whatever it was, it's it's gone. And and interestingly, that came about through negotiation. Um, on the negative side, um, you've got North Korea, which has you know officially gone nuclear with a nuclear test in in late 2006. And you've got an Iranian program that has not been slowed at all, and that has accelerated. Well, I've, I've talked to Clinton administration officials who view the Bush administration foreign policy on North Korea as a complete and utter disaster. Yeah. That in fact, uh, there's far more fissile material floating around now that That's right. terrorists could potentially get access to than there was at the end of the Clinton administration. That's right. Yeah. I mean, it's I, you know, it depends on what estimates you look at, but. You know, there was a suspicion that the North Koreans might have had enough plutonium for one or maybe two nuclear weapons um, at the end of the Clinton administration. And now, you know, we're talking about 10 to 14, you know, plus you've had the test and therefore whatever knowledge the North Koreans gained from that. So, I mean, that's a really significant failure, Um, you know, as is the uninterrupted continuation of the Iranian program. Um, You know, they were not enriching uranium in 2001. They are, you know, enriching uranium with, you know, some level of success uh, today. So that's a big failure. Um, You know, I also think, you know, the situation between India and Pakistan uh, has not exactly stabilized. Pakistan is obviously far less stable. And the nuclear programs of both those countries continue. And, in fact, we are uh, in an effort to, I guess, ally ourselves more closely with India you know, the Bush administration is actually pursuing aid to its civilian program, um, which uh, just 
because of the way uh, the, the link between the civilian and the military in the nuclear realm works, you know, will actually help India build up its nuclear arsenal as well. So these are, you know, these are big, big steps backward. Um, you combine that with the fact that there's been a, you know, an increase in terrorist attacks worldwide, a dramatic increase, not only, you know, in Iraq and Afghanistan as, as a result of the invasions, but, you know, just, just globally. And you, you've got a, a big, big threat. Um, the key so here where does, where is, does is this... really to, to get rid of the fissile material. Um, right. It's, it's, this is another way of, you know, going back to what we were talking about earlier, you know, not focusing on intentions but capabilities. You know, we're not going to get rid of every terrorist in the world. You know, even if, you know, we would never think we had, even if we had been very successful, there are always going to be evil, nasty people out there. But, you know, the, the, the blessing, if you will, of nuclear weapons is that to make one, you've got to have some highly enriched uranium or plutonium. There's a finite quantity of that stuff. If we can, you know, get rid of it or lock it down, uh, you've, you've in essence eliminated the problem of nuclear terrorism. So George W. Bush's history, or at least in, in 10 yeah. months he is, what's your take first on John McCain? We have um, Bob Kagan writing in The New Republic that it's all about a struggle for power and right. in the world affairs that America is in fact really a neocon nation. Do you believe that McCain will make the Bush presidency just look like a dress rehearsal for the (laughs) policies that you outline in your book? Um, You know, I don't know yet is is the honest answer. I mean, McCain is an ideologically interesting guy. It may be that he's not a particularly ideological guy, and that's why, you know, at at least I'm having difficulty classifying him. I'd be curious to hear what what you think as well. I mean, I think it's tough to tack an ism on the end of of John McCain's worldview. But, you know, there there are a number of signs that he is going to continue uh, the Bush approach to foreign policy. I mean, to, to, you know, go all the way back to the beginning of our conversation when we're talking about good versus evil and kind of a Manichaean view of the world. I mean, this is a guy who really sees the world in terms of good and evil. He talks about the war on terrorism or the struggle against Islamic, you know, fascism as as the transcendent struggle against evil. Um, he he very much uh, uses this sort of of rhetoric. Now, you can use the rhetoric and and not kind of carry that observation to its logical ends. You know, we'll have to see what what he does. He's said some things that you know very much, I think, comport. With the ramifications of that worldview, he does not want to negotiate with North Korea. He does not want to negotiate with Iran. He wrote a piece for the Weekly Standard, um, I think in 99, called Rogue State Rollback, which was the, the you know, directly taken from Burnham, um, and that's the strategy he wanted to advocate. You know, at the same time, in his big Los Angeles speech on foreign policy the other week, he said, you know, we ought to reaffirm our commitment under the Non-Proliferation Treaty and talk about nuclear disarmament. I mean, that's a... That's not what, you know, I would have expected to, to come out of his mouth. So I don't know, but, but, but tell me, I mean, uh, what's, what's your take on John McCain? I mean, you know, given all the thinking you've done about neoconservatism, where do you think he falls in this, in this ideological pantheon? Um, I, I talked to someone and I said, well, McCain swallowed the uh, neocon Kool-Aid, and he's, he's a former national security advisor who I won't name, and he said, no, he's sipping it. Oh. Um, I think... With McCain, two things are, are very important culturally, and, and one is the Vietnam War. He obviously doesn't want to see Iraq be Vietnam redux. And the other is the idea of, of manhood, that martial valor is displayed on the battlefield. Many people haven't really picked up on this, but that's very much a, a neoconservative idea. I mean, William Crystal and, and and others, they worship, you know, Winston Churchill as the last symbol of the virile politician, right? And and McCain is kind of uh, is, is is in a way a. I mean, he's not going to be on the level of Churchill, but he is a, a former warrior, and uh, he's also a politician who's who's climbing the greasy pole to try and become president. I suspect that someone like John Bolton would be head of the CIA under McCain, and I think it would be, I think it would make Bush look kind of like a warm-up. Hmm. My, and I think 
it would be pretty disastrous for American and, foreign policy. And how policy. do you think that's going to manifest itself? What what specifically do you see coming well, down despite, the pipe? Well, despite despite who knows? I mean, I, I can't. You can't. No one knows until they actually get into office. But I fear that dis, that this, despite McCain's talk in that speech in Los, An- in Los Angeles about reaching out to allies, you know, if the United States were, say, under McCain presidency to to attack Iran, I mean, I could I could see pretty much close to the end of the NATO alliance mm-hmm. and and Germany pulling out of Afghanistan, for example. Mm-hmm. Um, now I don't. No, you know, these are, t- I'm just spinning out scenarios here. The other p- part of my, and, and maybe McCain will pursue a more realist course, uh, but I'm skeptical. Um, the, I, I just think innately there's an attraction uh, that you sketch out in your book, and I think, it's an in- I think it's a very seductive attraction for intellectuals because it, this, this, the Manichaean worldview you talk about also makes the intellectuals feel like they're on the front line, that their ideas actually matter, that we're in this in this new Cold War, this new battle against fascism, to me, the rhetoric is completely hypertrophied. It has no relation to reality. And uh, what your book and, and others, we, we are following essentially a suicidal course. But, uh, and, and a very solipsistic one, because I think, uh, you know, what your book shows, I mean, much of, many of these quotes that you adduce in your, in, in your book are laughable. I mean, they're so parochial that people have no knowledge of what, uh, the, the Europe, let alone the Soviet Union, looks like or, or behaves like. Um, they, they're just, it's a very reductionist view, which yeah. you sketch out very well. But the other flip side of my question is, how much better would things, I mean, it's easy enough to tee off against conservatives, um, but how much better, how much more effective do you think either uh, Barack Obama or Hillary Clinton would be at actually implementing uh, and policies that uh, would seek to reduce the, the threat of, of nuclear terror in the United States. I mean, yeah. how much how much easier would it really be for them? I mean, I, I think it's going to be a difficult thing, no matter who comes into office. I mean, this is not. It's, it's not an easy circumstance. It's not an easy set of circumstances. And, and sort of each component of, of addressing the nuclear threat, whether it's country by country or sort of sub-issue by sub-issue, is, is going to take a lot of effort. But I think the advantage that someone like Barack Obama has coming into office is just that he starts from the opposite worldview, basically. He, he you know, although I think Obama has, you know, occasionally alluded to you know, good and evil in the world. It's it's in you know more of a rhetorical style because his his you know propositions for the way that the United States has to engage the world is very much it's one of it, it, I mean it's one of engagement and it's one of of leadership, and that's a very different thing from saying we're going to try to you know we're going to try to sort of stand apart from the world not in in the sense of isolationism but in the sense of not engaging with people that we we don't like and you see this in. You know, in, in McCain's um, concert of democracies, which on the one hand sounds like, hey, we're going to work more closely with our allies. You know, we're not going to have a repeat of the run-up to the Iraq War. You know, you can also interpret it as just sort of a more exalted version of a, of a coalition of the willing, where we're going to surround ourselves with, you know, you know, yes countries, people that agree with us. We're not going to do the hard work of bringing along, you know, the 180 other members of the United Nations or whatever. And, and I would argue that if you want to stop nuclear proliferation or roll it back, you're going to need those other 180 countries, and, and particularly the ones that are, are the most troublesome, like Iran and North Korea. Um, you know, nonproliferation, it's a global problem. You know, if you think about the AQ Khan network, I mean, this was not... You know, this was not just, you know, North Korea being bad. This was, you know, Pakistan, you know, being bad in the form of, you know, particularly AQ Khan and a, and a global, you know, network dedicated to, to, you know, fomenting this technology. So it's going to need to be an international effort. We need someone who can bring other countries along with us. And, and just, you know, the basic worldview that someone like Obama brings to the office means that, you know, he's not starting with this enormous ideological handicap. That, you know, it does not mean it's going to be easy. Peter, I, thanks for the cogent and incisive remarks. Uh, it's, it's just as much uh, pleasure to, just, to read the book as it is to discuss it with you. I'm Thank going to hold you. it up.
uh, so that there you uh, go. viewers can see it. And I urge you to not only read, but also purchase U.S. U.S. <laughs> versus them. And uh, thanks. Thank you so much, Jacob. Talk to you later. Bye.